to order. My name is Ted Gatzis, Executive Counselor for District 4 and a member of the GASA, the Governor's Advisory Commission on Intermodal Transportation. The GASA Committee is made up of the five Executive Counselors and the Department of Transportation Commissioner. The purpose of tonight's hearing is to discuss in the update of the state's 10-year transportation improvement plan. The plan, which you will hear more about tonight, covers the years 2021 to 2030. This hearing is one of 20 hearings being held in the five counselors districts around the state. The hearing is an opportunity for all the executive counselors and the Department of Transportation to obtain public comment on transportation issues, priorities, and needs in each region. It also provides an opportunity for feedback on the projects in the draft 2021 to 2030 10-year plan and whether available and projected revenues amounts meets the needs of the state. The 10-year plan process in New Hampshire originated in the late 1980s and is required as part of RSA 28, 22899 and RSA 240. The process allows for regional planning commissions to work on communities to develop local and regional needs and priorities and then allows the department to make recommendations to GASIT. The governor and the legislature, <coughs> ultimately New Hampshire legislature determines the final priorities are relative to transportation projects in, e in New Hampshire. Each cycle of the 10-year plan takes about two years to complete and as one cycle ends, a new cycle begins. For this 2021 to 2030 10-year plan cycle, the process began in the fall of 2018 with the planning commissions working with their staff, cities and towns to weigh in on transportation priorities within their regions. The department then looked, took the commissioner's input and its own ideas and prepared a draft of the 10-year plan. In addition, informational GASIP meetings were held in, on June 19th, July 30th and August 14th, 2019. Following the public hearings last month and this month, the department will make a revised draft 10-year plan for GASIT to consider at meetings to be held in November in Concord. Subsequently, the 10-year plan will be forwarded to the governor in December, who will in turn forward to the legislature in January. The legislature will hold additional hearings and enact the 10-year plan into law by June 2020. <coughs> then the process begins again. There's already been much discussion and coverage in the process regarding the financial status of the 10-year plan. It is important for us to hear your comments and thoughts on this. Written comments regarding the 10-year highway plan may be submitted through November 8, 2019 to the Department of Transportation. The address is NHDOT PO Box 483, Concord, New Hampshire, 03302, Attention Bill Watson. This address also is noted on the bottom of your agenda. Peter Stamus, Director of the Project Development from the Department of Transportation, will make a presentation regarding the 10-year plan. After that, Nate Miller from the Southern New Hampshire Planning Commission will discuss regional priorities and other themes of concern that have come up in their technical committees. So with that, I turn it over to Peter for his 15-minute presentation. Thanks for coming tonight. Again, my name is Peter Director of Project Development for the HDOT. Also here with me tonight at the front desk, uh, Deputy Commissioner Chris Waschuk, <coughs> Assistant Commissioner Bill Cassison is in the audience, Glenn Davison, Project Manager for the, for the uh, uh, update of the 10-year plan. We also have some other planning staff here uh, that have provided materials for you when you came in. Materials that you receive is a uh, supplement. Uh, this includes my presentation and additional information that you'll find useful. Um, Yellow Book is the draft 10-year plan. It includes all the uh, projects in uh, alph uh, alphabetical order with funding information included in it. There's also some uh, uh, an acronym list. There's a lot of acronyms, so this is also available uh, to you. So over the summer, we met with Gasset on a number of occasions, and uh, we uh, we discussed funding scenarios, we discussed investment needs, we discussed 
asset conditions, both current and projected in the future. And it was all in an effort to identify strategies that uh, we would utilize to update uh, the 10-year plan. There are uh, many needs um, across the state from a transportation standpoint. We have limited funding to address all those needs. We need to be mindful about how and when we invest in, in transportation. So um, through these meetings, we, we identify these strategies. And we made these recommendations to GASSET, and they concur to these recommendations, and they are as follows. First and foremost, we're going to maintain and preserve the existing system by uh, investing in pavement preservation, investing in bridge preservation, and also investing in redless bridges. We have dedicated SB 367 funds, particularly along pledged rural roads and bridges. We'll talk about that a little later on in the presentation. We're going to complete I-93 sale to Manchester and increase funding for I-93 engine 4A in Gary London Dairy. We're going to financially constrain this plan on the federal side to $183 million per year. That's across all 10 years of this draft 10-year plan. Include $50 million with the Regional Planning Commission priority uh, projects. That's $25 million in 2029 and $25 million in 2030. Going to address major project cost increases for I-93 Exit 4A, I-93 Boat Concord, and Interstate 4R projects by utilizing Garvey bonds uh, for two major bridge projects, Hinsdale Brownboro, Seaver Hampton. Also delaying construction on I-93 uh, Bow Concord by two years from 2024 to 2026. And we're utilizing uh, a $2.2 million transfer across the, um, all uh, years in the, in the draft 10-year plan. We're transferring to other federal categories. And that's uh, uh, congestion mitigation and air quality CMAC uh, funds. We maintain and extend all programs by two years and also all existing uh, individually listed projects are included in this, from the, from the current 10-year plan, are included in this draft 10-year plan. We're going to invest additional SB 367 revenue and paving to improve projected conditions. And we're going to increase investment in bridge preservation and resurfacing programs to mitigate inflationary impacts on the overall program. The next few slides are going to do a high-level synopsis on the funding across the draft 10-year plan beginning with the uh, Federal Highway Funds. Federal Highway Funds are provided by the FAST Act, and the FAST Act uh, runs through the end of this fiscal year, 2020, 2020, excuse me, 2020. and uh, the apportionment for 2020, the amount of funds that we get through the FAST Act in, 20, uh, in, this, in this fiscal year is $183 million per year, and that's what we uh, constrain this plan to, that $183 million per year. And the, uh, the basic breakdown for uh, investing um, is as follows. Paving and bridge projects average, average approximately $107 million per year. Mandated federal uh, programs like CMAC, again, congestion mitigation and air quality, or highway uh, safety improvement projects, HSIP, average around $31 million per year. Garvey debt service through 2025. Garvey is a, is a federal uh, bond that was issued to uh, construct a good portion of I-93 Salem of Manchester. And the debt service on that bond, that $195 million bond, is $24 million per year. The balance of that $183 million, or $21 million per year, is used for individual uh, roadway projects. On the state side, government funding, $24 million per year, and that's used on preservation and maintenance of roads and bridges not addressed with federal funding. Turnpike funding for capital and turnpike renewal and replacement averages around $67 million per year. SB 367 funding for I-93 expansion, state aid bridge program, and tip and debt service. So SB 367, 4% gas tax was introduced and it raises around $36 million per year. And 12% uh, comes off the top, goes to municipal block grant aids, you're left with $32 million per year. 6.8 million of that uh, total goes to the state aid bridge program, which invests in municipally owned bridges. I-93 debt service, so part of the, uh, uh, the uh, SB 367 program was a $200 million loan uh, that was issued to uh, fund the balance of I-93 construction, and through 2025, we're paying uh, 
interest only on that loan, uh, two million dollars per year, and with that, um, with that Tipia uh, note, there was a pledge to do paving work and bridge work on rural roads. Fourteen million per year goes to paving, and nine million dollars per year goes to bridges. That pledge ends in 2025. Beginning in 2026, debt service on that $200 million Tipia note <coughs> from, uh, goes to uh, $23.4 million per year, and that's the full principal and interest payment on that $200 million note. And that and that pledge goes away in 2025 on, on paving and bridges. For airports, uh, $288 million program in this draft on the transit <coughs> side, FBA, total of $312 million program in the 10-year plan. This, uh, this uh, mode also includes uh, capital core project development phase, which was introduced uh, by Senate Bill 241, and that's included in the FDA side of, of the plan. Railroads, total of 10 and a half million program in this draft. Overall active transportation. So uh, active transportation categories include uh, bike, head, trails, paths, curb ramps, sidewalks, and what we did is we took a look at this uh, draft 10-year plan and identified projects within our within our program, identified it for, for active transportation, and also looked at individual roadway projects that had active transportation elements um, in them. And what we found was $173 million, $174 million of uh, active transportation efforts. 141 million and 46 individual projects, and 33 million um, from a programmatic standpoint with the uh, uh, ADA uh, transportation alternatives and the rec trail programs. Again, that have a transportation focus. The map on your right is also in your handout um, and identifies the uh, projects themselves that um, include active transportation elements um, that are shown uh, across the uh, across the state. Notable program funding changes include $10 million per year that's added to the resurfacing program in both 2029 and 2030, and also $6.5 million per year added to the bridge preservation programs in those, in those last two years of the, of the plan, and that's to uh, uh, mitigate for inflationary impacts on the program. SB 367 revenue. So we got a, a, a new estimate for revenue uh, this summer. And it added two million dollars overall to the total, and we're we're moving that two million dollars into the resurfacing program, and uh, beyond 2025 is about a million and a half in uh, revenue that's available for the resurfacing program through through 2030. On the betterment side, there's also additional revenue coming in, and we're moving that to the resurfacing program through 2030. Each year, there's a million dollars additional funds. The five redless bridges added in the two outer years of the uh, draft 10-year plan. There's one interstate rehabilitation project that was added to 2030. And uh, again, the CMAC program was reduced by 2.2 million per year to 8.9 million per year. <coughs> so this uh, table is in both your supplement and in the 10-year plan, and it, and it identifies investments across uh, categories, and this is for all funding included in the in the ten-year plan. So your categories are across the top, fiscal years, bottom, basically total on the bottom with percentages. Three point nine two billion dollar plan, and some of the estimated program expenditures are shown in the bullets below the below the table. Um, we've also uh, done a comparison between the current ten-year plan and the and the uh, draft ten-year plan, current and green. Um, and the draft is in blue. And again, it compares the total bottom line totals for each one of those categories. Uh, so you can see how things have changed and there's some details from a bullet standpoint at, at the bottom of the, of the table in your, in your slide. Again, this is all in your, uh, in your supplement. So this slide identifies the <coughs> red list bridges um, on the state system. So a bridge makes it onto the red list when uh, one of its three major elements receives a poor condition rating on a scale of one to 10, that's a four. Uh, so one of those elements uh, receives poor condition, and makes it on the red list. And this graphic shows uh, red list totals on the state system 
Um, from 2003 out to what we're projecting in, at the end of the 10 year plan, currently we sit at 129 on the, uh, in, in 2019. Everything to the left are, are actual numbers uh, based on historic data. Uh, you see that it fluctuates over time. Again, it's dependent on how much money we're investing in, in bridges and also um, how quickly redless bridges are coming on to the list. Uh, everything to the right is projected uh, totals. So if, if you can see um, in the next few years, uh, we're making pretty good progress on uh, redless bridges based on the investments that we have. We're down to a low of 124 in 2026, which, which brought it basically the lowest we've seen in this time period. At the end of the 10-year plan, uh, we expect it to increase to 146. So um, some of the work uh, that we've been doing from an investment standpoint is really beginning to pay dividends. So there's one-time investments uh, that were made, uh, general fund surplus, HB 1817, $20 million went into the state program, and also the rural road uh, and bridge pledge uh, for SB 367 is making a difference. We're also beginning to see uh, dividends from our bridge preservation program. So we've been uh, investing um, in preservation of bridges uh, for, for a number of years now, and what it's doing is it's slowing uh, the progression or the rate of bridges coming onto the red list. So we're getting, we're investing early before the problems become bigger and require a lot more investment overall. Um, so I said there were 129 uh, bridges on the red list currently. 125 of those are addressed in this 10-year plan, either through individual projects or through our Operations Bureau, uh, Bureau of Bridge Maintenance, um, who also does work on red list bridges. So uh, similar to our bridge assets, we, uh, we, we, uh, we track our, our conditions of our roadway assets and our pavements. So this slide gives you a uh, miles of road uh, cave on the state system by year and also uh, pavement condition in good or fair. So uh, right here, 2019, everything to the left, similar to the bridges, um, is actual miles paved. You can see how it's fluctuated over the years, and our target line is approximately 500 miles per year. We pay more than that, conditions improve. We pay less than that, and conditions worsen. So on the bottom here um, is the, is the uh, payment condition, uh, which is good or fair on the statewide system. So we ride um, uh, roads once every two years, and we assign a roughness index to them, and uh, this condition this, this really shows uh, conditions in good or fair over the over the uh, on the average on the on the statewide network. Similar to uh, similar to bridges, over the next five or six years, uh, we project pretty good roadway conditions. And that's based on a seventy-four million dollar per year investment on the state side. Um, over time, uh, we expect the condition to worsen about fifteen uh, percent to sixty-eight percent good or fair. And a lot of that has to, that reduction has to do with uh, the uh, SB 367 Rural Road uh, a pledge um, terminating and, and sunsetting in 2025, and also inflationary pressures on, on the program itself. A lot more information about SB 367. It's a, it's a, it's a uh, significant program for us overall. Uh, this pledge is approximately $257 million and uh, by the end of the pledge, we expect uh, 2,175 miles of rural roads again uh, to be paved. And these, many of these miles uh, would not have been paved uh, in this time frame if not for this pledge and the, the funds provided by the 4 cent gas tax increase. There's also uh, 25 redless bridges included in the pledge. Three of those bridges, uh, two are complete, seven are in construction, and 16 are in design and will be starting design soon. A uh, graphic on the right shows the locations of bridges included in the pledge and also the uh, segments of roadway that have been paved to date. And this table is, uh, is our uh, funding related uh, graphic that shows uh, the previous one was category related investments. This is investment by funding category. So 10 year plan, <coughs> multi modal plan, and um, we have investments across all modes. 
um, this blue area here, highway and bridge mode, um, and then uh, this purple area to the right uh, includes the other modes, rail, transit, airport. 85% of the funds in this plan are on the highway and, and, and bridge side. So uh, just like the, the previous table, you can see what type of investment is being made under that particular category. And the importance of, a, of this table is that uh, each one of these CAD funding categories comes with eligibility rules and <coughs> leaves, leaves us limited discretion to move funds uh, from one project or one category to another because of the eligibility uh, rules that exist um, in those funding categories. So it leaves us limited discretion um, to, to make significant changes overall. This also includes a revenue uh, piece down here. Um, and basically, um, what it says is we get a $3.92 billion investment plan, and there's $3.92 billion worth of revenue coming in. So it's fiscally constrained. Um, this slide is a comparison between the current 10-year plan and the draft 10-year plan across the funding groups. And, and identify some of the changes within um, those, those funding categories. Mentioned that there were a uh, $50 million investment in Regional Planning Commission uh, priority projects in the outer two years. Uh, this identifies uh, nine regions and each of the number of projects by region and the total federal allocation in that $50 million pledge. Uh, Nate uh, Miller will provide you a little more detail about this, but there are 26 uh, projects and $50 million worth of investment again. 2029 and 2030. So we're in uh, District 4, Council of Gasses District. Uh, the, the graphic on the right is also when you supplement and it highlights the yellow area is the, is the district boundaries. And what this this uh, this map shows is uh, the individual project listings within the draft tenure plan within these boundary districts. On the back side of the plan, and you supplement, will provide you a, uh, a project uh, name, number, location, uh, a, a small scope of uh, effort, and year of construction. So you can you can see by location where the projects are. There's details on the left here in that table for um, the types of projects uh, that are included from an individual standpoint within this uh, within Council Gatsis's uh, district. That will turn it over to uh, Nate Miller, Southern New Hampshire Regional Planning Commission. He'll go through Regional uh, Planning Commission uh, priorities and philosophies. Thanks, Pete. Well, good evening, everyone. My name is Nate Miller, Deputy Director of the Southern New Hampshire Planning Commission. If you're not familiar with the Southern New Hampshire Planning Commission, we are an organization that serves the 14 municipalities, including and surrounding the city of Manchester. Our role in this process, under RSA 228.99 and RSA 240, is to make sure that local and regional project priorities are reflected in the draft 10-year plan. To do that, every two years, we solicit project needs from our 14 municipalities, and then we work with our 14 municipalities to evaluate those projects and set priorities. Those priorities are then uh, given to the New Hampshire DOT, and they, that's what forms the draft 10-year plan from the regional side. Uh, all nine regional planning commissions around the state go through a similar process. As Pete mentioned um, at the end of his presentation, based on uh, a revenue projection that New Hampshire DOT developed, uh, Southern New Hampshire Planning Commission was uh, uh, authorized to allocate just over $8.5 million of projects in this 10-year plan update. Um, as we embarked on that process, we really had two kind of guiding philosophies. The first was to work with New Hampshire DOT to make sure that major projects of statewide significance that were occurring in the region uh, are fully funded and, and proceed according to their schedule. I'll talk about what those major projects are in just a moment. And then we used basically the majority of that eight and a half million dollars of, of uh, funding for this cycle and took a hard look at the existing projects in the 10 year plan in the region. We identified a few of those projects that we knew to be underfunded in the current 10 year plan. And we used um, that eight and a half million dollars of funding to add supplemental funding to those projects to try to get those projects to the finish line. And I'll talk about those projects in a minute as well. 
the major projects of statewide significance that are happening here in the Southern New Hampshire Planning Commission region. I'm sure everybody is familiar with the I-93 expansion from Salem to Manchester. That project is coming to an end as this draft 10-year plan begins. So uh, the construction aspect of that project is coming to an end, but if you look in that yellow book, you'll see a number of Salem to Manchester projects listed in the draft 10-year plan. Those are debt service projects. So even though the construction is coming to an end, we still have financial commitments in this 10-year plan uh, throughout the 10-year plan in the form of debt service projects. As Pete mentioned in his presentation, Exit 4A, uh, the project in Derry and Londonderry, uh, is moving forward in this 10-year plan scheduled for construction between 2021 and 2024. There has been a cost increase associated with that project, and this draft 10-year plan does reflect that cost increase. Next week, next Wednesday night, October 30th, here at the Manchester Community College, there will be a public hearing. Uh, at 6.30 p.m. on the I-293 Exit 6 and 7 reconstruction project. So I encourage anybody to come out and have their say about the I-293 Exit 6 and 7 project next week. This is a fundamentally important project from a safety perspective and a congestion perspective here in the city of Manchester. Uh, so if anybody is interested in learning more about the design of that project, I would encourage you to come out uh, next week on the 30th of October to, to, to hear about that and, and offer your comments. Uh, this 10-year plan uh, still carries the same schedule as the last 10-year plan for I-293, Exit 6 and 7. So Exit 7 would be reconstructed between 2024 and 2026. Exit 6 scheduled for construction during 2025 to 2028. That's consistent with the last 10-year plan. Uh, lastly, another very significant project is the FE Ever Turnpike expansion uh, from two lanes to three lanes uh, from Nashua through Bedford. Uh, that project is scheduled for construction from 2021 to 2025. So lots of significant projects happening in and around the city of Manchester in this draft 10-year plan. As I mentioned, the Southern New Hampshire Planning Commission in its process committed uh, the majority of its $8.5 million allocation for this 10-year plan update to three existing underfunded projects in the 10-year plan. The first of those is uh, the widening of Route 3 in Bedford between Hawthorne Drive and the Manchester Airport Access Road. That was put into the 10-year plan four years ago. It's programmed in the current 10-year plan for $5.5 million uh, of, uh, for construction in 2026. We know that in today's dollars, that project is approximately $16.4 million. So we, we knew that that project was underfunded in the draft 10-year plan. So the majority of the region's allocation in this cycle was added to that project for supplemental funding. Even so, in the draft 10-year plan that, that you all have in front of you, that project is programmed for $13.27 million, which doesn't get that project to the finish line. So in two years, we're going to be talking about this project again and how to get it to the finish line. Um, two years ago, a project was added in the 10-year plan for a corridor study of Route 114 in the town of uh, Bedford and Goffstown. Uh, at the request of the town of Goffstown, that project is being extended from Mass Road to Henry Bridge Road. Uh, and so that's, it's really a scope expansion, not so much a cost in increase for this project in the draft 10-year plan to reflect that request from the town of Goffstown. In the town of Windham, we had a project that was added four years ago um, for intersection safety improvements at Route 28 and Ralston Road the town of Windham. This is really an area where there's been a significant crash history and, and some real safety concerns, fatal and severe crash history at this location. Uh, the project was programmed in the current 10-year plan for $233,000 with construction in 2026. Uh, $233,000 in 2026 dollars doesn't carry you very far for an intersection construction project. So we identified this as underfunded and in this draft 10-year plan, the project is programmed for $1.54 million. Uh, a significant portion of that cost increase is related to uh, the need to upsize a culvert structure that serves an impaired brook at that intersection to a bridge structure. So uh, there are some environmental factors that are driving that cost increase. Uh, some highlights of projects here in Manchester uh, that you'll see in the draft 10-year plan. A new project that's being listed for the first time in this 10-year plan is the construction of uh, uh, the South Manchester Rail Trail 
from Perimeter Road to the Londonderry Town Line. This is the, the final segment, the final gap in the South Manchester Rail Trail. This was funded as a, a transportation alternatives program project in 2018. At the same time that this project in Manchester was funded, Londonderry received funding for their final portion in the northern part of the town of Londonderry to the Manchester City Line. So the gap of that rail trail in both the very southern portion of Manchester and the very northern portion of Londonderry, both those gaps will be filled and that trail will become a, a more complete corridor in the future. So that project is scheduled for construction in this 10-year plan in 2026, and I think uh, all of us in the room hope that, that it happens sooner than that. Um, the CMAC project, Congestion Mitigation and Air Quality Project from 2017, which is Manchester 41747, to implement adaptive signal control on Granite Street and improve the uh, signal performance on South Willow Street. I know that's a very important project for the city of Manchester. It's been a, 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 a big priority for Manchester Public Works. And uh, we, we stand ready to work with the department and the city in any way we can to try to get this project to construct as quickly as possible through the LBA process. Currently programmed for $1.53 million in 2021. Uh, the project we added two years ago to rehabilitate the structurally deficient bridge carrying Hughes Road over I-293. Uh, we're very pleased that that project is being advanced to construction to, in 2023 in this 10 year plan. So that, that project is being moved up and constructed earlier than, than we otherwise anticipated. So that's a, a, a pleasant note in this 10 year plan. Lastly, the, the project that we added two years ago to make operational improvements at I-293 Exit 1 uh, is programmed for $2.27 million in 2028, and that's very consistent with the 10-year plan two years ago, so that's slowly making its way uh, up the 10-year plan. From a public transportation perspective, and I know Mike Whitten is in the audience today, I would note that the Manchester Transit Authority merged with CART, CART being the the uh, Cooperative Alliance for Regional Transportation, the public transportation provider that served uh, and serves Derry, London Derry, Hampstead, Chester. Uh, uh, that was a standalone organization. It is now a program administered and operated by the Manchester Transit Authority. So the projects for CARP and, and, and the Manchester Transit Authority in the 10-year plan will need to be merged to reflect that. Lastly, I uh, the Pete mentioned the passing of Senate Bill 241. So Senate Bill 241 passed earlier this year is now law, and as a result of that, the draft 10-year plan includes funding to advance the project development phase of the Capital Corridor Passenger Rail Project. That phase of work includes engineering and environmental work as necessary to, to complete a financial plan uh, for the service. Uh, and, and that project will focus on an extension of, of uh, MBTA commuter rail service from Lowell to Manchester via Nashua and Bedford, Bedford being the potential service uh, stop for the airport. Uh, so that project is in the 10-year plan, uh, at least the project development phase, and is, is moving forward in this 10-year plan as a result of Senate Bill 241. And with that, I will yield uh, back to you, Councillor, and thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Peter, for your uh, presentations. And now I'd like to hear from anyone who would like to speak I would ask you to keep your comments to three minutes so that we can get everybody to speak. First, Keith Hirschman, the City of Manchester. Thank you. I'm Keith Hirschman from the City of Manchester and the resident of uh, 296 Dunbarton Road in Manchester. I'm here to advocate for 24212 in the eastbound bridge to Salmon Street. It's scheduled for 2024. That is, uh, bridge that's sadly uh, in deterioration and we could use that uh, program as our number one. Number two is the bridge uh, westbound from Salmon Street to West Manchester, the Interstate Bridge West, 24206, same year, 2024. Also in 2024, right where we are is uh, number three, I would say is 16099B, reconstruct exit 7 uh, on 293 and extend that to Dunbarton Road uh, to alleviate uh, traffic and accidents and public safety concerns at the interstate Rotary, which is exit 6. And that would be number 4 for me is uh, 
16099A, reconstruct and widen MSCA exit 6 in Manchester, which is uh, sadly needed, but uh, without the 2025. If you can uh, keep those dates in stone for us, we really appreciate it. We need those bridges fixed quick. And uh, 293 uh, relief, we can certainly use that as soon as possible. Thank you. Those are my comments. Thank you, Larry Gagnon. And I'm Larry Gagnon speaking on behalf of Bike Walk Lines of New Hampshire and the Grand State Health and Fitness Foundation. So I'm going to make an emotional plea here for very specifics. Everything's important. Everything that you've presented, and thank you very much for this report and all the details. Appreciate that. Um, so if the CDC is right, 30% of us are obese in this audience. So my focus is, is that when I look at this and I hear all the details around 85% of the budget focused on roads, cars, 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 and cars, I get it. And everything is important. I understand that. However, I will tell you that as part of this you know, plan is that what's the vision? If we have a national crisis of obesity, what are we doing to address it? So on behalf of Bike Walk Alliance of New Hampshire and Grand State Health and Fitness Foundation, a couple of things I want to put in front of you. Please continue to support the development of infrastructure that increases the safety and number of cyclists and pedestrians. Specifically, the New Hampshire Rail Trail System, give priority to Grand State Rail Trail. And I heard the good bullet there. Thank you. In general, the tenure plan continues to focus on that motor vehicle, but what about active transportation? Modes. If more funding is placed on these active transportation modes, we know statistically that more people will bike and walk and fewer vehicles will be on the roads, meaning the safety and health. So with that, thank you for the opportunity to present. Thank you, Mike Whitman. Uh, in a similar vein, I'm here to talk not about roads and bridges, but about public transit. I do appreciate there was half a slide that wasn't talked about, but at least it was there so we could see it. I really want to stress the importance of continuing to flex the $800,000 in STBG funds. Uh, that's used for 5310 purchase of service projects in the region. That is the only way we would be running service right now in Dockstown, Cookston, New Boston, and a number of communities around here. As you know, the state for the last decade has provided it absolutely zero dollars in operating assistance for public transit. So while there's tens of millions of dollars in the presentation, that's almost entirely FTA pass through. So local communities that have to come up with all the local pass. So the city, for example, pays up $1.4 million a year. That 5310 funding is the only thing that lets some of the smaller communities that lack the resources in an urban city like Manchester to have some level of transit. So that's critical that that's the end. And the other is to ask that the DOT look at the local match on some of the capital projects. We do appreciate that the DOT will pay 7.5% of rolling stock purchases. That helps local communities not have to raise quite as much taxpayer dollars for vehicles, but it's limited to only vehicles. So if you need facilities or critical safety improvements, things like bus shelters, none of that is eligible for a nickel in the state. Place all of that burden on the local community. So any help that we can get there so that you know, we're not downshifting quite as much on the small towns and the local cities. That's how we connect more communities within the public transit network and get away from this kind of fragmented kind of system in Ashford, we have a system in Manchester, we have some system in Portsmouth. We really can't connect with any of them because the small towns just lack the resources to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Tom Christensen. I'm not here as a representative of the Friends of Star Park, but we are interested in, in eventually developing a rail with trail concept between Southern Manchester University and the Milliard. Notice how I use the word trail, and, uh, sorry, rail with trail. And I point that out because I'm new to this whole business that you're talking about tonight. And it was only through information like this that people are putting out that I gain, gain that knowledge. And I'd like to particularly point out this hardcover book, or softcover book, I should say, printed. And I know that everyone is concerned about conserving trees, and I'm an environmentalist as well. 
I personally think that's a throwaway line as we abandon things like this that allows us to easily get information. When we put everything online, we think we're saving money, we think we're making it easy, and granted you can search things, and I, I agree with that. But this hard copy, I'm sorry, this paper copy and the paper material have allowed me to quickly embrace all of what you're doing. And I would not want that lost as you're trying to save money in this process. Thank you. Representative Fred Platt. 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 Yes, thank you. Uh, great job. I'm not here to pick on any one project try to move around or anything. But my concern is uh, bridge preservation. And uh, I see new bridges being built, wonderful high beams uh, with a coat of paint on them, and then nothing's done, and the paint wears off, the rust starts. Uh, so I just asked for state of the art coating, whether that's four can or ceramic or something, to preserve those bridges so that we don't have as many red listed bridges coming up. And I don't know what that state of the art is, but I think a, a, a penny more uh, spent on good coating would last, would, would uh, gain us several years of use. That's all. Kathy, stop. Good evening. Um, thank you for this opportunity to provide my perspective on the transportation needs of the state going forward. My name is Kathy Stout, and I live in Manchester. And um, I, where I have nearly every form of intermodal transportation available to me, from bike trails to a regional airport. The one form of transportation that is missing is commuter rail. In expressing my support for the proposed Capital Corridor Rail Project, I could talk about the benefit of vehicular commuters who would welcome this alternative to driving, and I could also talk about how the introduction of a new commuter rail line would reduce carbon emissions and dependency on fossil fuels. Um, instead, I would like to focus my remarks on how providing access to passenger rail would help Manchester and Nashua develop as secondary economic hubs. The city of Boston is very concerned about how their growth and success have increased the number of people who commute to the city for work. In fact, the MBTA is so interested in extending this commuter line um, because uh, they want to mitigate their traffic issues and meet the goals they set for themselves as part of the regional greenhouse gas initiative. Um, but rather than thinking of the rail project as a way to move people from New Hampshire to Boston, we should also expand our thinking to include how the presence of the passenger rail service will spur economic development in the National Manchester Corridor and amplify the returns on the infrastructure investments that we have made in those areas. Um, first, consider the impact of rail on the Manchester and Boston Regional Airport. Um, the airport is a huge asset, and a rail connection will make it more attractive to people who prefer not to drive when they arrive. Our airport director has indicated that airlines considering coming to the Manchester airport always ask about rail connections. Secondly, Manchester and Nashua account for a significant part of the state's economy. Businesses are driven to locate in places where they can find the workers that they need. Rail service will expand this pool of potential employees to include people who do not want to drive. It is also worth noting that every day, 2,000 people commute to Manchester from Nashua for work, and 2,000 people commute from <laughs> commute to Nashua from Manchester. So there are 2,000 people switching places between Manchester and Nashua every day. Um, finally, um, this remaining piece of our transportation puzzle is what my city needs to spur the transit-oriented development projects that will transform our downtown and milliard areas is the kind of thriving small city that will attract millennials and innovate businesses and that will spur economic development throughout the state. Thank you. Thank you. Mayor Craig. Thank you. Uh, first, I want to express my strong support for the I-293 exits uh, 6 and 7 project. Uh, this area has been a serious uh, safety concern for many years, and it's important that this project gets done. Uh, secondly, I'd like to strongly support the inclusion of the I-293 exit line South Willow Street interchange improvements project uh, in this plan. Right now, the traffic on this ramp, exit ramp already backs up onto the highway during peak traffic hours, and I encourage the committee to support inclusion of this critical safety project. Lastly, I fully support the inclusion of the funding of the project as a development phase of the capital Corridor project. 
For years, Manchester residents, the business community, and the Chamber of Commerce have advocated for the expansion of commuter rail to our downtown, and I'm thankful that this funding is included in the draft plan. Thank you for being here today. Thanks. Matthew Great. Matthew Grady. Close enough. Close enough. Um, hi, my um, name is Matthew. I'm a Manchester resident, and my primary um, mode of transportation is biking. Um, so, in that vein, I would like to um, show support for the continued efforts for um, completing the Manchester Rail Trail uh, network. Um, we have many trails that lead to Manchester, but no nothing that's actually coming to Manchester. So the projects that are um, on the 10 year plan, the Rockingham Rail Trail um, extension, um, the Southern Manchester uh, Rail Trail extension, the London Dairy Rail Trail, um, I would love to show support for those projects. Um, and additionally, uh, please work to continue to improve the multimodal connections um, over the Merrimack that connect uh, West, and either West Manchester and Central Manchester. Um, currently, there's five bridges, but only one is really safe and convenient um, to bike across, and that is the Piscataquad Rail Trail um, Pet Bridge. Um, so as rehabilitation projects uh, come up, I would like to uh, voice support for having some sort of um, multimodal approach in the design. Thank you. Derek Schuster. Hi, I'm not sure if I'm Manchester. Um, the 10-year plan includes funding uh, for three projects in Manchester and one in Londonderry. That was the projects 42508, 40428, 41361, and 42509. Like Manchester support the inclusion of these local projects in the state's 10-year plan. Thank you for that. Uh, there appear to be, as you showed in your slides, $3.92 billion worth of projects programmed statewide in the 10-year plan. Including the four projects noted above, as well as uh, 13 other bike head projects highlighted and highlighted in the other executive council regions, uh, there is only $18 million worth of investment out of $3.9217 billion uh, for bicycle and pedestrian infrastructure. This is also for bike head specific projects, not complete streets interpretations or road or bridge projects that have a bike that combination. And that's not spelled out very clearly in the report. If there's an opportunity to better differentiate that in the report, that would be very much appreciated. Uh, but again, that's 0.46% of the total plan total is for bicycle and pedestrian infrastructure. Massachusetts, by comparison, programs 7 to 8% of the statewide uh, transportation improvement project or programming to so bike pet projects each year more than 16 times what New Hampshire does. New Hampshire needs to program more funding to bicycle and pedestrian projects. The transportation alternatives program, TAP, is uh, appears to be the only consistent statewide funding source for community bike and pedestrian projects and it's grossly insufficient given the demand for bike pet project funding elsewhere in the state. Please supplement TAP funding with funds from surface transportation law grants, STBG. I didn't note this in here, but I noticed from your slide you said $2.2 million was deauthorized from CMAC, Congestion Mitigation and Air Quality Funds. I implore you to reconsider uh, programming CMAC funds for bike head projects as eligible. Uh, please broaden the state's CMAC program eligibility requirements to include consideration for micro-mobility projects. New Mexico and Massachusetts, for example, have set precedent, precedent uh, of determining bike share and e-bike share programs uh, that are eligible for communities in their regions, their states to apply for CMAC funds. Uh, and this is something that FHWP is supportive of as an innovative financing means. And for the burgeoning micro-mobility uh, uh, emerging trends nationwide and globally. This is something that the state should more seriously consider uh, putting any funding toward. Uh, in the event Gasset does agree to more equitably fund non-vehicular transportation modes, please reassess the TAP project's missions from across New Hampshire to program in the out years of the 10-year plan. 
what I mean by other TAP submissions is that in the Manchester region alone in 2016 and 2018, there were about four to five communities each round that submitted applications for review and only one is selected by region. If you expand that across the entire state of New Hampshire, there are dozens of unfunded and forgotten about projects that if only there was a funding source statewide, we could better build out the bike and best green network. And finally, please identify funding from the Highway Safety Improvement Program, HSIP, uh, for mid-block crosswalk improvements on the state's trail and shared use path network. As little as $300,000 a year that communities could apply for could yield projects that significantly improve bike head and also vehicle safety. Um, I also want to echo support for rail, uh, support for any and all intermodal transportation considerations. Uh, Southern New Hampshire Planning Commission to continue uh, leveraging STDG funds for the transit opportunities that currently exist and would like to see continue to exist and grow in uh, this region. Please don't touch that. And I also print four copies for each of you. Todd Connors. Todd Connors from the City of Nations Department of Public Works. Uh, I want to express my thanks to uh, the DOT, Southern New Hampshire Planning Commission, and the Council for all the hard work that goes into the state's 10-year plan. Uh, the City of Manchester has a number of projects in there that we are tracking and we're excited about. I would like to express my support tonight for the I-293 exit 67 project as one of critical importance to the city of Manchester. I want to also recognize a couple of other projects. We've heard a lot tonight about bike trails and bike projects. Uh, we have a number of projects that are in the plan, um, specifically project number 40428, which is our downtown connector trail, as well as project number 42509, which is the most recent project that will extend our South Manchester Rail Trail out to the town of Londonderry. Uh, these two projects, the funding dates, seem to have slid in this plan. The downtown connector was previously funded in 2019, and now it's projected to be funded in 2023. The most recent project, which was a TAP grant from the 2018 round, will work to us this past January, that has a projected construction date of 2026. Uh, the City of Manchester would like to see the funding uh, schedule for the construction of those trails accelerated from what's in the current plan. Uh, the only other comment I'd like to make tonight with respect to uh, bridge projects uh, 24206 and 24212. That is the Salmon Street Bridge Network, which is the Amscape Bridge System. There's, there are three spans there, eastbound, westbound, and a ramp. Um, the previous 10-year plan had funding for those bridge spans uh, identified as construction 2021, and um, the construction in the current 10-year plan has slipped six to eight years, depending on which span we're talking about. We also don't think that the estimates that are included in the 10-year plan uh, accurately reflect the level of rehabilitation that those bridges are going to need. So we'd like to just call some attention to those bridge projects and ask that they be considered for uh, additional funding as well as an additional uh, bump in the schedule so we can get to them a little bit sooner. Uh, with that, thank you very much. Uh, I'll submit my comments in writing. Appreciate it. Thank you. I'll go to Dan O'Neill. Dan O'Neill to 49 West Haven Road in Manchester. I want to thank my former colleague, Councilor Ted Gatches, for hosting the Gasset hearing this evening. Uh, I want to thank all at New Hampshire DOT for the continued partnership with the City of Manchester. I want to thank DOT for being responsive to Manchester's priorities as well as the priorities of the region. I appear before you uh, this evening wearing three hats as an alderman at large in the city, as a member of the Southern New Hampshire Planning Commission, and probably most importantly as a citizen of our great state. I want to thank my colleagues and the staff of the Southern New Hampshire Planning Commission for a thoughtful and transparent prior prioritization process. I express my support for the Hughes Road Bridge over I-293 in the 10-year plan. I express my continued support for funding the Manchester Transit Authority's elderly and disabled services. Uh, I support construction of the final segment of the South Manchester Rail Trail project in the 10-year plan. I support the funding through CMAC grant for the adaptive 
uh, signal projects on both Granite Street and South Willow Street. I support the construction, uh, reconstruction of exits 6 and 7 on I-293 in the 10-year plan. I support the widening of the F.E. Everett Turnpike project in the plan. And finally, I support in the plan the project development phase for the uh, Capital Corridor Passenger Rail Project with the hope that it will bring commuter rail to Nashua and Manchester. Thank you for the opportunity to appear before you this evening. Thank you. Derek Clardy. Thank you for having the time to hear the comments that everyone has brought this evening. Um, moved here two months ago to Manchester, and I uh, come representing myself as Manchester resident, um, father of school-aged children, and a nurse in the Elliott Emergency Room. Um, the concerns that I have regarding the material we've been addressing this evening uh, specifically relate to the effects on public health that transportation planning uh, has. As an ER nurse uh, for the last couple of years, um, not in this area, but the statistics are very similar, uh, we've seen an incredible increase in adolescent and childhood uh, mental illness, depression, and suicide attempts. A lot of that, um, when we back that up and say, what can we do to stop that, goes back to lifestyle issues that children and families face. When we look at the charts and, and graphs that you guys have put together for us. There's a pie chart in there at one point that talks about the, the breakdown of, of where funds are allocated. Active transportation is not listed. I know it is in there under kind of subcategories, but it's not really listed in that pie chart at all. As we see with adults and children, the more active we are able to be, um, as Larry brought up, the benefits are exponential. Uh, New York City did a study, and one of their most inexpensive um, funding for uh, increasing the quality of life in their city was to increase the transportation infrastructure supporting active, trans active transportation. Um, when I think of my own kids and, and what I hope to see uh, for their lives and their futures in this state, I appreciate the New Hampshire Department of Transportation's mission statement, which highlights the goals of preserving the quality of life that we have here in Northern New England and in New Hampshire. As we see technology increasing and uh, the issues that come with vehicular traffic and, and transportation, we can look at other places to see the benefit that active transportation plays. So I advocate for that tonight, appreciating the specifics that Derek and others have pointed out, and just asking that you guys, as those who have the data, the expertise as you look at your planning priorities and remember our children, our families, and the effects that active transportation can have on our communities, our health, and the future. Thank you. Is there anyone else who should speak? Can I make one additional comment? Please. Yeah. Okay. All right. I'd like to thank all of you for coming to this hearing. I appreciate you taking the time to come and make your comments. All comments will be taken under advisement. If there are no other comments, I hereby adjourn this meeting.